Um, so I'm recording now. I'm going to uh, open another um, uh, tab and share my screen. Okay, um, so this week we're talking about video games and art. Um, and we're gonna look at some different examples from the art world and their approach to video games. Uh, and one of the things that I think you guys will notice is that this sort of like demarcation or line between like what counts as a video game and what counts of, as art is pretty arbitrary in a lot of cases. Um, and what we actually see a lot more of, which is kind of interesting, is the art world co-opting video games rather than um, the other way around. Um, so we'll see some examples of that. So uh, this is on the lectures page, just uh, scrolling down to the bottom, um, video games and art, and just clicking on notes. And oh, whoops, I need to make sure this is in the same tab. Let's see if I can do that. OK, there we go. Um, so this is also a lot of just like video examples that we're going to look at. Um, so this is a quote. Oh, we can't actually see the whole quote. What happens if I make this wider? Oh, we still can't see it. What if I make it smaller? My screen is like smaller than usual because of the way that it's cropped, but okay, I'll just scroll down. Okay, so this is a quote from a uh, Museum of Modern Art uh, show, um, whoops, about video games. Um, there's a link to the original program there. Uh, and they say, are video games art? Um, they sure are, but they are also design. And a design approach is what we chose for this new foray into this universe. The games are selected as outstanding examples of interaction design, a field uh, that MoMA has already explored and collected extensively, and one of the most important and oft discussed expressions of contemporary design creativity. Our criteria, therefore, emphasize not only the visual quality and aesthetic experience of each game, but also the many other aspects from the elegance of the code to the design of the player's behavior that per pertain to interaction design. Um, so I think this is kind of an interesting quote, just as far as the way that this uh, very recognizable um, uh, art institution is kind of trying to situate games as something that they want to have some authority over by talking about them, but also not saying that video games are art. They don't want to like blur that line either. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting uh, the way that they're you know trying to kind of like both express authority over games, but also kind of like distance themselves from games at the same time. Um, I could go into that, but it's not really uh, that important. Um, let's look at some art games. And so these are some games uh, that have uh, been you know, built over the years that have been either made by artists or uh, made with the intention of creating art rather than uh, specifically a video game. So. Uh, Jaron Lanier, who you guys might be familiar with from a lot of other things that he's done. He was a pioneer of virtual reality. He's also written a lot of books about like social media and stuff like that. Um, but in his very early work, uh, he was making his own Atari games, which was like pretty unusual. You had to be a pretty good uh, programmer and probably also a pretty good electrical engineer to be able to make your own Atari games. Um, so he made this Atari game called Alien Garden, which has this kind of like unusual uh, visual gameplay. I want to skip ahead a little bit.
So I'll pause that there. Um, one of the things I like about this uh, game, oh, is the sound not working? Can you guys hear the sound? No. No, OK. Um, let me try re-sharing the screen. Chrome video games art. Um, can you hear it now? Yeah. OK, sorry about that. Um, so uh, anyway, so what I kind of like about this game, it's a very old game, so I think it's hard to understand exactly probably what it felt like in context when it first came out. But it, it's using the language of games, uh, including the sound that we uh, couldn't hear in this case. But um, it's using the kind of aesthetic and sound language of games. But it's not really a like linear game experience where you can uh, collect coins and die and do these other things. It's more of like a kind of a simulation game almost, except it's kind of abstract. So um, in this game, he's kind of playing with those different expectations uh, to create uh, more of a uh, kind of aesthetic or narrative experience. Um, um, he also made this game called Moon Dust, which is kind of more similar to like a uh, like a Garage Band type like uh, like music. Uh, 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 what would you call that? Like a not Garage Band, uh, rock band, kind of like music uh, simulation game. Um, so this is all from the same era. Um, So in this game, it's kind of like a collaborative music thing where by driving the different vehicles, you're generating different types of sound. And then there's these sort of like targets and things that you hit. So it's kind of combining these different concepts into one um, kind of scene. Um, so then around the same time, uh, this uh, project Lorna is like kind of like the far uh, narrative uh, example of an interactive, it's basically an interactive film, um, but it's using, I think it was using like a laser disc or something like that, but it was using interactivity where the user could actually choose the ending uh, by clicking on different chapters, essentially. Um, we'll just watch a little bit of this. Or oh, actually, this is a pretty short excerpt. Now you might say that Lorna was controlled remotely, not only by her own access, but by the participants who were able to use their own remote switch to choose what they wanted to see or to hear. For instance, if they chose their telephone, they could select one of several channels and therefore get different interpretations. Of so that kind of gives you the basic idea here. It's basically like a film, but the user just using the channels of the, of the disc player could choose uh, different scenes. So uh, Lynn Hirschman Leeson is, an, is a video artist and filmmaker. And most of her work is, you know, just uh, straightforward linear uh, video. But she also was interested in using the interactive technologies um, similar to video games in order to create uh, interactive narratives. Um, this is a very early interactive fiction uh, by an author named Michael Joyce. This is, again, more in that kind of like narrative direction where you could uh, sort of choose the narrative by clicking on different uh, words in the text, and that would kind of take you through the narrative uh, in different um, paths. I don't think there's any audio for this one, so.
So let's keep going. Um, Trigger Happy is a, uh, a, a browser-based game by Thompson and Craighead, who are actually kind of more internet artists than anything else. Um, let's see if I can, oh, I have to make sure to load this in the same window. Let's see if that works. Um, and so it's basically a game that kind of looks like Space Invaders, um, but what you're shooting uh, is actually like Western uh, philosophy text. And the idea is to kind of like destroy uh, this sort of like oppressive concept of Western philosophy inside of a video game. Um, so it's a pretty simple, basic video game, but it's kind of has this like layered uh, historical or philosophical meaning to it. Um, hmm. I wonder if it's really loading. Oh, no, I'm getting a bunch of errors. Uh, I don't know if this actually, this should work, but um, I don't really think we should wait. But anyway, you can kind of get the idea. And if you're interested to check it out, you can um, go to this link later. Um, I should probably find a video for that one. Um, so let's keep going. Um, SOD is a project by uh, the collective Jody, which is a, a two artists um, who made a lot of uh, video work as well as interactive work. And what SOD is, is basically like a hacked copy of the video game Wolfenstein, um, where they basically just took out all of the textures uh, and replaced them with just black and white graphics. So what you see is just like the architecture of the game without any of the um, visual signifiers or any of the meaning that you might get from the game normally. You do still have the original audio as well. Uh, yeah, I can. It sounds like uh, Wolfenstein. Uh, yeah, it is Wolfenstein. It's oh. a hacked version of, of Wolfenstein. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, so you can see by, you know, kind of taking out the elements that look familiar and replacing them with these black and white abstract patterns, uh, you get a very different experience of the game. We still recognize kind of the space of the game and uh, the experience of the game, but we have a different kind of meaning overlaid on it. Uh, the Intruder is a project by Natalie Bookchin, who's a, uh, also a big internet artist and, and digital media artist. And it basically takes a bunch of different uh, game tropes and applies them uh, using a text from a Borges uh, short story. Um, so we'll just watch a little bit of the beginning of this. Passing the love of woman. So in this case, it's not actually an interactive work. It's a video uh, that uses. Uh, Or no, I'm sorry, this one is uh, is actually interactive. I forgot which one we were looking at. Uh, but this is obviously just video documentation of the project. People say, but it is unlikely, that the story was first told by Eduardo, the younger of the Nilsons, at the wake of his elder brother, Christian who died in his sleep sometime back in the 90s, out in the district of Moron. The fact is that someone got it from someone else during the course of that drawn out and now dim night between one sip of mate and the next and told it to Santiago da Bove, from whom I heard it. 
I set down the story now because I see in it. So it goes through a lot of different uh, video game styles and, you know, small interactions uh, to create um, this kind of like uh, new experience, interactive experience of this uh, short story. Um, Mario Battle No One uh, is another hacked uh, video game where an artist took the Mario cartridge and hacked it to remove everything except for uh, Mario and some of the basic scenic elements. So In the year 2000, oh, the year Nintendo just hear. applied for its patent, Mifonway Ashmore hacked into a Super Mario Brothers game ROM. Mifalme removed all of the architecture, prizes, enemies, and performance enhancing drugs so that all you can do is go for a walk. Mario becomes the user's avatar walking aimlessly through the digital landscape, a solitary mission without an obvious goal, saved as Mario Battle Number no. 1 or Mario Battle No 1. As there is no captured Princess Peach toadstool, no need for heroism, no monetary prizes, no amphetamines to make you stronger, there is nothing left to do but go for a walk, run, or jump around, solitary in the landscape, and then you run out of time and die. In Mario doing... Uh, so there's a few different uh, variations of, of this one, but it kind of uh, is a bit of a precursor to the like indie uh, walking simulator that we talked about last week. Um, uh, Facade from 2005 is like an AI game where basically it tried to it tried to kind of put the user into like a, a theatrical uh, sort of narrative play where you could actually talk and respond to these characters and they would respond to you in different ways. Um, it's sort of like ridiculous looking uh, Andrew, now. The graphics. Ah, I'm so happy you could make it. We haven't seen you in so long. How's it going, man? No way. I've seen that game before. Really? Yeah. So my uh, one of oh, YouTubers uh, played I mean, it before. Really, really great. Oh yeah. Come on in. Oh yeah, it was dash. Andrew, hi. So at the, at the time, you know, this was this pretty interesting, interesting kind of sophisticated AI. Uh, but reading about it was a lot more interesting than actually playing it because it was pretty buggy. It was pretty easy to like screw it up. And uh, the narrative itself, it was like very highly reliant on this story of the relationship between the two characters that you the you as the user sort of get implied in. Um, and it's, it feels a little bit uh, kind of like overwrought for what it is, but uh, still kind of like an interesting uh, technological uh, example. Um, so then The Marriage by Rod Humble uh, is a game that tries to kind of like uh, like abstract gameplay. So instead of having like things that look like things in the real world, he's just using shapes. Um, but then he's trying to use the gameplay to create the narrative or create the experience in this case of, uh, you know, of a marriage that it's uh, the game is called The Marriage. Um, but he's trying to kind of just use gameplay elements as as the fundamental uh, components rather than representing thing, things using like, uh, you know, an image of a man and a woman or, a, 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 you know, two people and a couple. Um, he's just kind of using different colors and shapes to represent uh, different components of of the experience. And there's some sort of like basic game mechanics. Um, and he did a lot of like experiments like this, uh, just kind of like trying to strip games down to their most basic components. Let's keep going. Um, so Jason Nelson is an artist that I like a lot who uses uh, game platforms as a medium, basically. Um, he did a lot of Flash games. Oh, I have to open this in the right window. Let's see if that works. Um, he made a lot of Flash games. Some of them have been ported or emulated. This one is one of them that you can play. Uh, his games are really uh, kind of wacky and messy, um, and he uses a lot of like texts from literature uh, and other sources, and then his kind of uh, really messy illustrations and then basic game mechanics. So you can see the instructions here. Uh, I'm going to try to play it for a second. Um, <laughs> Come on, 
wanna meet your maker. Uh, so you can see with that game, the focus is sort of on aesthetics and the sort of narrative content that's going on in there. Um, and it's also pretty silly, like it's obviously kind of like messy on purpose and he's kind of using uh, game mechanics as this kind of medium um, to tell a story more than, you know, it's not really like uh, a traditional sort of game with puzzles and stuff. Um, another uh, sort of pseudo game, I would say, is this uh, pop methodology experiment one, where it's using a lot of video content and then it kind of is interspersed with game content uh, where you actually have to interact with stuff, but it's really more of like a video art piece than anything else, um, but it's pretty wild. Keys. Okay, so far so good. So rather than relying on a keyboard or we need to the mouse. When we said reality will never be the same, we weren't kidding. We've given you all you really need to know to all and video games. And so they join the stream of family life in the suburbs. All right, let's get to play. So it's really talking about video games um, as well as sort of being a video game. Um, so those are examples of games. Uh, this next section is is really art that uses games uh, or kind of appropriates games aesthetics, but is not actually interactive. Um, really famous example of this is a Cory Archangel piece called Super Mario Clouds. This is a different version or a different approach to kind of a similar idea where he took a, a Super Mario cartridge and hacked it um, and took out everything except the clouds. And then he made like a, a one channel video um, that has been shown, I think, in like the MoMA and like maybe some other uh, art institutions. And it's just this. It's just this for like however long, like six minutes almost. Um, so using the video game aesthetics to create uh, an artwork. Um, this is a piece that uses uh, like forum threads, and then it kind of like mushes a bunch of video game uh, characters into this weird uh, 3D guy, and he kind of reads them. Um, it's by an artist named Edo Stern, who uh, also works Hello, with video I games. I recently accepted Christ into my life about two months ago. I've been living with a Christian family for about four months, and before I became saved, I was an atheist. Now on the subject of World of Warcraft and other games, I find that my father does not approve of this game at all, so I am asking, should I as a Christian who wants to stay in the light be playing World of Warcraft? He does so you can see the content uh, from the, the video is inspired by this, or it comes like literally from this video game thread, but then it's kind of like mashed together um, with other video game aesthetics. Um, this is actually an interview with an artist named John Rathman who does video work. Um, this video, is, it says it's age restricted, so we're going to have to go over to YouTube. I don't remember this video having anything really bad in it, but I guess it must. But in the video, it's in Second Life. Hi, Nicole. And uh, John Rathman, this artist, is the uh, Kool-Aid man. And another artist named Nicholas O'Brien is interviewing him about his work. And he kind of talks about how he uses, not specifically video game, but like uh, the aesthetics of modern life. And they go to these different real places in Second Life and um, kind of have this interview. History and, and your kind of uh, art education, I guess you could say, but also your, your uh, kind of the early part of your career, which is like invested in cinema and film history. 
and I'm wondering how uh, that kind of um, education or that fascination or that interest or that part of your kind of early part of your career has like spilled over into kind of more recent work. An underlying thing or goal is a constant search for artistic tools and methods that best represent or reveal modern experience. So I look for ideas and inspiration from those who also struggle to represent, you know, their experience of modernity, uh, whatever. So in Rappin's work, as he talks about, he's interested in this kind of modern experience and video games are a big part of that. Uh, uh, Second Life is, you know, not really a video game. It's a, it's mostly a social network with um, 3D rendering, but it uses these sort of like familiar tools of, of video games. Um, and his other work is it references video games a lot as well. I think we just have a couple more examples in this section. Um, ready for action, grid number one. Uh, this was a piece that was installed. I can't remember which museum it was, um, but it's a four channel video piece that just shows uh, people in various different games waiting for public transportation. And that, that's kind of the whole thing. It's a little bit like the Mario Clouds one. Um, but it's using more modern games. And so it's kind of interesting to see how artists have created games as a way of exploring games as a medium and interactivity, but also using uh, the content of games to create new works of art, um, using that content as a medium uh, and kind of remixing it or doing different things with it. Um, yeah, John. I was wondering, uh, what's the third game, bottom uh, left? Um, I don't remember. We can look at the YouTube description. Does anybody recognize that bottom left game? <laughs> uh, it doesn't say in the YouTube description. Does anybody know? I forget. Looks like Daisy. Or H1Z1, yeah. Um, another uh, sort of use of games that it kind of overlaps a little bit, but is a little bit uh, tangential, is uh, machinima, which are uh, movies that are made uh, by shooting video inside of games. Um, I just have a few examples of this. This is one of the earlier uh, ones of this. Um, where a film was made just by recording uh, gameplay. Um, I have a couple more examples of this. Somebody mentioned, what did you guys say? L is real. I haven't heard of that one. I'll have to check that out. Um, I think Machinima is kind of interesting. We see, now that we have like people streaming games all the time, you know, we can kind of watch games as though they are films all the time. So it's a little bit uh, different, but um, there's some interesting early films made out of uh, game uh, assets or, you know, live footage from games. Oh, uh, another good example uh, would be red versus blue. Would that count? Red versus blue. The Halo? Um, yeah. I don't Halo know that film. one either. I'll have to check that out. That will count. Uh, and then Molotov Alva, one more example. In 
January of 2007, a man named Molotov Alva disappeared from his California home. Recently, a series of video dispatches by a traveler of the same name have appeared within a popular online world called Second Life. What follows is his story. So, you know, making a film using these things that other people have created rather than having to like, you know, shoot actors and scenes in the real world, um, they can make a film just by uh, using uh, video footage from games that they might be playing or, um, you know, they might see online or something like that. Um, so here's the some games from that MoMA show. Uh, games that have been recontextualized as art. So these are actually games that were originally published as games, are not intended to be um, you know, art pieces, but were included in that MoMA show as a way of kind of like saying these are these are sort of the the works of art of of the game industry. And so you can kind of see that there's some uh, the criteria what I think is really interesting here, and I'm not going to click on all these links because uh, I'm going to have to like load them in the browser and da da da. But you guys can go check these out. They're all different videos. But what I, I think you can tell just by looking at this list is there's this sort of like these different rules that are applied. Like why would Tetris and Pac-Man be here but Mario isn't, I think is kind of interesting. And then some of the games that they include, like Another World, uh, are clearly just included because they have like good visuals. I don't know if you guys have played Another World. Maybe we'll look at that one. Um, it's a cool game, but it's not like an interesting game from a gameplay perspective. Uh, it's pretty hard, but it's, you know, I think it's mostly the aesthetics that they uh, kind of put in here um, and the narrative. Uh, uh, and then they have stuff like Katamari, which has kind of like interesting uh, game mechanics, but then, you know, it, it, I, it's just kind of interesting to look at, like, what they see as worthy of inclusion in this, like, sort of art context. Um, what about RuneScape? The last... Uh, sorry, what? I said, what about RuneScape? Well, right, exactly. It's like, why would they include, uh, you know, these these specific games? I mean, I guess they had to choose some games over others, but... Uh, it's just kind of interesting to see what they included and what they left out. Um, a few other shows that have like kind of curated video games, um, you can see here, uh, most of them are kind of like curated shows of games uh, created by, uh, you know, various different people. Um, one example is a Jason Rarer exhibition that's just his works. He, he's really the first like video game creator that has had like a, essentially like a solo show at a big art institution. Um, you know, for whatever, interesting from like a, basically a context perspective. So those are some other links to check out. Um, but yeah, that's it for video games and art. Any, any questions on any of that? All right, cool. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording.